And welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Bob Schieffer. Well, yesterday, President Obama made a rare trip up to Capitol Hill on a Sunday for what he called a pep talk to senators who are mulling over health care legislation. We're going to get the latest on where everything stands on health care, including that uh, abortion amendment. In just a minute, we'll talk about the moderate Democrats and where they are in all of this with Nancy Cordes, who's at the Capitol this morning. Also, we'll talk to what many people call the brains behind the Obama campaign, David Plouffe. He'll be in the studio here with me to talk about his new book. But first, let's get the latest on that health care debate. Nancy Cordes is on the Hill this morning. Good morning, Nancy. Well, where are we on all this? Good morning, Bob. Well, this is really going to be a heady week of negotiations, primarily among Democrats now, because they seem to have settled into the realization that they are not going to be able to get 60 votes, which they need to pass this health care bill, unless they work out some kind of compromise on the public option. In the beginning, Leader Reid went forward with this strong public option in his bill, but there are still those four moderate holdouts who have said they don't want it, they won't vote for a bill that has it. So now we see these feverish negotiations between liberals and those moderates trying to come up with some kind of alternative to the public option. And right now it looks like the public option, after being declared dead for many, many months, actually may be dead this time. It's hanging by a thread. Uh, also, uh, the big uh, vote, I guess, today, the next big one is uh, some sort of an amendment uh, 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 about ab uh, abortion. What, uh, tell us exactly what that's about and, and where does that go? Well, this is uh, roughly the same amendment that passed in the House of Representatives a couple of weeks ago, created a lot of controversy, however. This time it's being introduced by Senator Nelson of Nebraska, a, an anti-abortion rights senator. Uh, and what it does basically is, in the bill, there's already pretty strict language banning the federal government from paying for abortions, the same kind of language that we've seen in bills since 1976. But this bill goes a step further than that and essentially says not only can the federal government not pay for abortions, but anyone who's involved in any kind of public plan can end up putting their own money into the plan uh, so that they would be able to have abortion covered by their private insurance. And so this is really dividing the Democratic caucus. Leader Reid wants to allow this amendment to go forward to the floor as quickly as possible so they can vote on it and get it out of the way. It's not expected to pass. But I just spoke with Senator Nelson's office a few minutes ago, and they're not exactly sure when he's actually going to offer the amendment, whether it will be today or tomorrow. Not sure what the holdup is there, but it'll likely be sometime in the next day or so. So, so what happens, Nancy, if the amendment does not pass? Then what do uh, senators like uh, Senator Nelson do? Would, would that cause Senator Nelson to vote against the overall uh, health care reform package when it's finally done? That's an excellent question. He hasn't tipped his hat on that because obviously it wouldn't be in his interest to say now, well, even if my amendment doesn't pass, I'll still vote for the bill because then he loses a lot of important leverage when it comes to this amendment. So we really don't know. He has said that it's extremely important to him, that this is a make or break issue for him. What he'll be saying after that bill fails, if it does fail, it might be very different. And timeline, uh, when do people still think that uh, the Senate can get this done uh, before Christmas, Nancy? Well, I spoke with Senator Claire McCaskill of Missouri this morning, and she believes that they're on track to come up with some kind of compromise that will allow Democrats uh, to get to 60 and hold their series of votes before the holiday recess. And that's what everyone is aiming for here. Leader Reid really wants to get a vote before everyone scatters for the holidays. And so right now they're looking at a December 18th deadline. Uh, but as you know, Bob, these deadlines have been made and broken many times before. So we'll see if this turns out to be just like all the rest. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Nancy, for that update. Nancy Cordes uh, on Capitol Hill this morning. We're gonna turn now to the day that many credit with being the uh, brains behind uh, President Obama's campaign victory. David Plouffe, he has written a new best-selling book, The Audacity to Win, which has a lot of inside stuff about the campaign. Uh, he's here in the studio. I just want to start here, David. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, you just heard Nancy. What advice, you, you're the one who kind of figured out the strategy to get a, a, a President Obama elected. Uh, what advice would you have for the Democrats right now in this health care reform? Do you think it's going to pass? I do. Well, thanks for having me, Bob. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it will. Uh, I think that so many Democrats ran for office for the first time mm -hmm. because they believe we had to do something about health care reform. This is our opportunity. We can't compete economically. 
uh, in the long term without passing it. So I think we will. We've got, still got some tough issues to manage here. I wish we were doing this with more Republican support. Maybe at the very end we may get a little bit more than people think. But uh, at the end of the day, we got to get this done. And I think the politics of it are secondary. We've got to do what's right for the country. But I think the politics of this long term are going to work out just fine for us because people are going to see the things they were told to fear, death panels, loss of doctor. None of that's going to happen. But the promise of health care reform, access for everybody, cost down, business is more competitive, that's going to happen over time. Do you think they actually will get uh, uh, some sort of a public option? And by that, uh, what we're talking about when we use that term is a government-run health insurance program like Medicare for older people. Well, I'm not involved in these negotiations on the Hill. I, I think the most important, the principle was we need competition. There's a variety of ways to get there. I think the president uh, has been clear. He thinks a public option of some sort uh, is a great way to get competition. There's other though. The most important thing is the principles of expanding coverage, guaranteeing cost reductions for the government, families, and businesses, uh, and ending insurance company abuses. I have confidence those are going to be part of any final package. I want to talk about your book, The Audacity to Win, and I must say, in this day of 24-hour non-stop coverage, it's really hard to write an inside hmm. account of something like a presidential campaign, the kind of books that Teddy White uh, used yeah. to write. Now, it's, it's almost like there is nothing going on behind the scenes. It's all out in front of the scenes because there's so much coverage. But you've managed to do it. There was a lot of stuff in your book that, uh, frankly, I didn't know about. Uh, one of the things that I thought was so interesting, uh, these days, uh, Sarah Palin is getting all this attention. Uh, she's got a big book out. Uh, she's going around talking and everything. She's obviously someone who can raise a lot of money for Republicans. There's just no question about that, whether or not she runs for anything. But I thought what was the, one of the most interesting th things you said in your book, uh, long before all of this current uh, thing going on about Sarah Palin, you said that when she was announced, she was not only getting a lot of attention for Republicans, but she became a big fundraiser for Obama. Tell us about that. She did. She was our best fundraiser and our best organizer. So there's no doubt that the one thing Palin did for McCain and the party was they created a little bit more excitement in their base. But I think she more than counteracted that with really, there was a lot of people who poured in their offices after McCain picked her saying, you know, I was for Obama. I wasn't necessarily going to volunteer. Sign me up. I'll be here every day for 60 days. Who gave money uh, because of it. So she really uh, drove a lot of intensity in our base and she still does. Mm -hmm. uh, she's still someone who obviously has, you know, maybe 20 percent of the Republican base feels very strongly about her. And no matter what she ends up doing, she's going to play a big role in their uh, future. But and I'm happy with that because I don't think that's where their party needs to go. But she drives a lot of attention in our base, too, and she did during the campaign. What uh, when when she was first put on the ticket by McCain, uh, did it bother you all? Well, I write about this in the book. First of all, we were surprised as anybody else was. Uh, secondly, it did because you know, Barack Obama picked Joe Biden first and foremost because he thought he would be a, a terrific counselor as vice president. Didn't put the campaign first. And our view was that this is a very important selection. VP picks generally have not made a big difference in the campaigns, but it's an important selection. About a third of these people historically have become president for one reason or another. So it's a big pick. And it was a little bit offensive that because it seemed like it was more of a political stunt than kind of a really sober assessment of who the best VP would be. Well, did you think at the time that it might help McCain? That, uh, I mean, obviously it, it played well with his base, but was your initial assessment was, was it that uh, this is going to help McCain? No, I write about this in the book, and I remember Barack and Obama and I having a long conversation that afternoon where we said, you know, this just doesn't seem right. It, it's something that's clearly going to be a source of fascination. She's a fascinating figure, someone of political skill. That was clear. Uh, and we had some people in the campaign who worked against her in Alaska who attested to that. But that, that at the end of the day, people are going to assess this on, was this a good process? Was it thorough? Was it a political pick or a substantive pick? And our sense was, on the other side of it, knowing that it would be viewed as a brilliant pick for a period of time, you got to remember, it was. There were days there when the narrative was brilliant, inspired choice. Palin's pick has reshaped the race. It's put states like Minnesota and Iowa back in play. You know, but our sense was, let's just be quiet. This will settle down. Now, we, so we thought it was going to be a pick that wasn't helpful to McCain even before she had her, her interview issues with Katie Couric and the Tina Fey phenomenon. Mm -hmm. just, just the fact, the way he went about the selection and the way pe when people heard about it, you know, they thought that Obama's seemed to be very thorough, methodical. Uh, his seemed to be a little bit more last minute and, and that bothered people. What, uh, what did you all think, and I know you have some stuff about this in the book, 
when uh, the first uh, debate was approaching down at Ole Miss, and all of a sudden McCain started talking about maybe we ought to postpone the debate. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth. I remember flying down to Ole Miss not knowing uh, if there was going to be a debate or not. Do you think that uh, had any impact on the campaign? Sure, it did, and you were not alone. We went down to Ole Miss and didn't know if we'd be joined by McCain or not. I mean, you've covered politics a long time. It's one of the things that makes it so interesting. Who would have predicted we'd have this scenario where you have a candidate suspending their campaign or claiming to and, and, and saying they're not going to debate? So mm -hmm. it's not something we plan for. I think so. I think that week was very instructive. McCain looked a little bit unsteadier. So here's the, the, the more junior candidate who hasn't been around Washington, Barack Obama, looking steadier, saying, you know, we, a president has to be able to do more than one thing at a time. In fact, there's no more important time for us to debate than now because people are concerned. One of us is going to be president. So yeah, I think the fact that there was some suspense about the debate, that McCain kind of changed his mind and decided to come down even though there wasn't a bailout deal, that Obama was steady the whole time. Basically, we said, we should debate, we'll see you in Mississippi. And he showed up. And then, you know, you might remember that was a foreign policy debate. Yes. And most people thought McCain would win it. I'm talking about the electorate. Mm -hmm. The fact that Obama was viewed the winner was big. So those three or four days, uh, you know, could have been three or four of the most important days in the entire two years. Because after that, we did gain a lead that was, uh, that was uh, we never relinquished. One of the most interesting things to me when I uh, moderated that last debate is uh, was watching the other guy when the other fellow was talking. And I noticed that when uh, Barack Obama was talking, uh, McCain would be taking notes, uh, and, you know, going back and forth. Obama, my re uh, recollection is, never took a single note. He kept his eyes on Obama the whole time, didn't say anything, and when he ever whenever he would take his pen in his hand, and I saw this, he would just draw a straight line across his notebook there. It was almost, it was like some sort of a Zen exercise. Uh, but he had this calm about him. And, and as you know, most of the overnight polls would show that Obama won. I thought he probably won the debates on demeanor more than substance. Well, I, I mean, I would argue, of course, he won him on substance, sure. too, all three. And it's, it, it's been a long time since a presidential candidate, well, I guess a ticket. We were judged by the voters to win all four debates. It's mm -hmm. been a long time since that happened, and it was a big, big deal. I think, you know, a presidential campaign is flawed in many ways. You could argue they're too expensive, too long, but they're very transparent, and you really can't hide who you are. And I think he was the same person for the two years in those three debates. People liked it. His demeanor now, I think he went into those debates very confident about what he was going to say. I mean, part of this, our, our reason we succeeded, we didn't have a lot of angst about our message, about our strategy. We knew who we were. Now, we weren't arrogant. We didn't know if it would work or not. But so he went into that debate very prepared. Uh, and someone who, he's also not someone, uh, and this was one of the reasons debates were challenging in the beginning, he's not a soundbite kind of guy. So a lot of candidates will write down the pithy line they're supposed to say. That's not really how he prepared for the debate. So he was just trying to listen to what McCain was saying, to the questions you were asking, uh, and respond to them. But his debate performance was a big deal. And I think so when people said, well, he's untested, he's unsteady, he's not ready, voters would say, well, you're saying that, but what I've seen in these debates would suggest something entirely different. Very, very interesting. David, uh, it, it's a very good book. Uh, and a lot of stuff in there that helps you understand this, uh, this campaign, which really was, uh, in all the politics and campaigns I've covered, I think the most interesting one I've ever covered, and uh, you really uh, put a lot of it in context. Well, so. you're kind to say that. Next time we'll talk about the BCS and what a travesty that is. As you <laughs> root for your TCU. Oh, I tell you, TCU is my team. <laughs> they should be in that championship game, David. <laughs> Thank you for joining sure. us this morning. Uh, that's Washington Unplugged for today. Bob Schieffer here. Have a great Monday and join us on CBSNews.com every weekday. We'll be right here.